Hello, welcome to the morning of the final day of the retreat. Today, I'm going to do a couple of different meditations with you, both about 12 minutes. And I'm going to do both of these raw, so I haven't read the material in the entirety, in its entirety ahead of time. I want to just go with you and do a rumination meditation on the material as we go. Because this is an exercise that you should be able to use while you're studying in order to take what you're studying and turn it into constructed realization and become familiar with it so that you can actually use these things as antidotes. So this is a book called Patience by Lama Zoba Rinpoche. I know that a couple of you are working on patience. You're working on antidotes to anger. So this text would be a wonderful investment and you can see well maybe you can't see but if you know the text you could see that he's drawing from shantideva's text here and i'm sure that at some, at some point he's going to draw from the eight verses for taming the mind in any case let us get straight into it so these are verses from shantideva's text <clears throat> A moment of ill will destroys all of these good deeds as well as generosity and worship of the Sugatas, even if one has practiced them for thousands of cosmic cycles. There is no evil like hatred and no ascetic discipline like patience. Therefore, cultivate patience actively by all means possible. As long as the barb of hatred is in your heart, your mind will find no rest, no joy, or happiness. It will have to have no rest nor steadfastness. The most urgent goal at present is to avoid the lower realms in our next rebirth and to receive another perfect human rebirth. The causes for such a rebirth are very specific. Perfect morality, great generosity, combined with a fervent wish to be reborn as a human being. So my very first task in terms of Lam Rim motivations on the small scope is just to do what's required to get another rebirth like this one at a minimum. And to do that, I need ethics. Why? Well, if I kill, I'll have a short life. So I won't have a life long enough to do any training. If I steal, I won't have the material possessions and so forth that I need in order to support myself. If I commit sexual misconduct and, and so forth, and I'm not a reliable friend, in particular to those very, very close to me, then my own friends and companions and so forth will be unreliable and cause a lot of trouble. If I lie, then I won't correct, encounter the correct information. So even if I get a human rebirth, it won't be one with the information that I'm getting right now. If I consume a lot of substances that change the quality of my mind and make me less careful, that make me sloppy, then I'll have a mind in the future that's less careful, less sloppy, less discerning. So it's probably wise to avoid intoxicants. It's probably wise to rely very, very well on my current teachers Otherwise, in the future, I won't have good teachers. Just like an, a river runs down to the ocean, knowledge runs down to the ocean of humility. If you're arrogant and puffed up like a mountain, very little water, very little wisdom will fall on you from others. You won't seek out help. You'll be satisfied with whatever it is you're doing, and most of what you're doing will be non-virtue. So you need humility. Uh, 
And then to help throw you into another human rebirth, you need the intent, the drive, the motive, that I must be reborn as a human being again so that I can complete my training. When we're angry, it becomes incredibly difficult to maintain any sense of morality. This is true. So if I want another human rebirth, I have to overcome anger or I'm going to do all sorts of negative deeds and I won't get the conditions that I need like this to do the training. On top of this, Anger also destroys our virtues. So in the same way that when you do purification and you generate, for example, loving kindness, that loving kindness damages the karma associated with the opposite states of mind, for example, anger. In exactly the same way, when you generate anger, it damages the positive karma associated with things like having generated loving kindness and compassion and having done all of these positive deeds in the past. So it says anger is considered the most damaging mind to have in that it destroys any undedicated merit. So at the end of each practice session, we, we say some type of prayer dedicating the momentum of our training in that session to something much, much, much bigger than ourselves towards the happiness of all beings and so forth. Why? Because if we don't, then those states of mind, those karmas are much more susceptible to being destroyed by a moment of anger. Why is this so? There are some arguments that would say, for example, if you, you know, if you take a cup of water and you throw it into a hot fire, the water will evaporate, right? Quickly, it just evaporates. So this is like building a fire of anger and your good deeds that aren't dedicated. They're not connected to any any other thing. You just throw them in the fire and they get they get evaporated right away. On the other hand, if you make a very, very big fire and you throw it into the ocean, the fire gets extinguished right away. It may evaporate a little bit of the water, right? But the ocean is so huge, it's so massive. And in order to completely uproot the ocean, the fire would just that would have to be unbelievably large. It would have to be cataclysmic, you know. So in the same way, when you dedicate your merit towards these really, really huge things like enlightenment for all mother sentient beings, removing the suffering of all beings, it protects that merit by adding it into a much larger pool a much larger pool of positive karma that is a type of karma that won't be exhausted until you attain awakening. By dedicating it in that way, for example, if you dedicated it for a better human rebirth only, then as soon as you got a better human rebirth, that karma would be expended. If you dedicated it towards liberation, as soon as you gain liberation, it would be expended. If you dedicate it towards awakening, that karma will continue to ripen again and again and again, all the way to awakening. And so this is much harder to damage by anger. However, even if we've dedicated our merit in the strongest possible way, it might be damaged, almost like a seed that's been damaged. Right? Sometimes if a seed is damaged, it's it's can't be used, right? It won't grow at all. However, sometimes if the seed is damaged, it, it won't grow right away, right? It'll take a lot longer to grow. It's missing some of the critical components it needed to get started and so forth. And so in exactly the same way, I really liked this analogy here. <laughs> uh it's like having done a job and we expected to get paid for that job right when we finished, but then right at the end, you know, like we're doing, we're doing some kind of, I don't know, 
some kind of gig work or something, and right at the end we have a huge blow up with the client or the boss, and they say, you know what, you know, you can get your money in court. <laughs> So it's not exactly the same, but it's an analogy that I think works. So in exactly the same way, we have to understand anger is incredibly damaging because all the hard work, Shanti Deva says, for eons, eons, thousands, millions, billions of lifetimes of work can be wiped out in a single moment of anger. If it's anger towards a very powerful type of object, for example, if there's a person who has bodhicitta or realization of emptiness, that person is in a position where they are literally, literally and actually benefiting every single other sentient being in the entirety of reality, limitless beings. And so if you generate anger towards them, that the power, the force of that anger is massive. And so it's very destructive, highly, highly destructive. So we need to overcome anger for these reasons. So the next short rumination we're going to do is on pride. And you're welcome to, of course, go back and, and do a whole host of ruminations on that text, the text on patience or on Shantideva's text or whichever set of antidotes you'd like, the antidotes found in the Lam Rim or other antidotes, things that actually make your mind move and do the rumination process that we talked about before. So in regards to pride, um, here's Lama Zopa Rinpoche, an astonishing yogi, the head of FBMT. A student in Wisconsin writes, I would like some advice. My mind becomes overwhelmed with pride again and again. I'd like to prevent it, but I don't know how. And Lama Zopa Rinpoche says, each time pride arises, so here he is again, he's starting with, with the negative implications of pride, the, the effects of pride in terms of karma, right? What are the drawbacks? He's starting there. And then he's also probably, I'm assuming, going to do uh, some other antidotes. Each time pride arises, it leaves a negative imprint on the mind. It causes strong delusion to arise. If it is dependent on lower objects, poor, ugly forms, all these different aspects that you see and from which strong delusion arises makes karma. This is very heavy and interferes with your achievement of enlightenment, which is the ultimate goal. Ah, water cannot stay on the tip of a mountain. Also, water cannot stay on top of an upside down container, meaning you can't receive any qualities or knowledge, not just intellectual understanding, but also realizations. Hmm? in your mental continuum. If you have pride, even in this life, you won't get along with others. Many mistakes arise because of pride. And that's not including the shortcomings in future lives. So let's go back a bit. When he says it's not dependent on lower objects, in other words, he's saying, we become puffed up and we think we're important. We think, oh yes, I've, I'm, I'm really something now. Don't you know who you're talking to? If we're more attractive than others, if we're more good looking, if we have more money, right? We go to a restaurant and we go, don't you know who I am? Do you know how much money I spend here? And we get puffed up in this way. And it creates distance between us and others. Where no one can talk to us. And we do this with all sorts of qualities. When we're young, we look at the old and we go, ha those old people. They're not young like us, energetic, doing things. And so we don't rely on the wisdom of those who are more experienced than ourselves. 
So pride has this quality of cutting us off from good teachers, good mentorship, good, good information. Even if you're running a business, it's very often said, if you want to become a millionaire in this life, for example, that you need to rely on mentors, good mentors, people who have already done what you're trying to do, become a millionaire by doing real estate or being a financial advisor or whatever the case may be. And if you're too arrogant to do that, it's way less likely, unless you're very, very lucky, that you're going to accomplish those kinds of goals. In exactly the same way, all of our realizations on the Buddhist path, if we don't have the humility to rely on those who have actually done what it is we're trying to do, how can we make progress? How can we make progress that way? If we're arrogant about our health, then in the future, we won't listen to other people's advice when it comes to our health, and so our health will degenerate. All sorts of negative consequences. In order to generate further antidotes to this, besides just thinking about the disadvantages, Lama Zopa is here saying in the thought transformation teachings, it says, examine yourself and think of all the ignorance that exists in your mind and how many subjects you don't know about, you don't know anything about. Also think about all the phenomenon that exist and all the subjects that you don't know about. When you know so little, what you know is so little, hardly anything. There's so much ignorance. In this way, focus on your shortcomings. So one way is to focus on our shortcomings. Before we were talking about, okay, if you have too much attachment where you're exaggerating the positive qualities of the human body, for example, an attractive male, man's body or attractive woman's body, you can contemplate what it's actually like. So in exactly the same way, if you look at your own mind, Right. And this isn't this isn't to go, oh, gosh, I'm so stupid. Everything is wrong with me. Right. This is not a big ego trip. This is just working on an antidote to an exaggerated positive quality that you're placing on your own self-image. So instead of that, you can go, you know, I don't know anything about Hardly, hardly anything at all about judo. So if I were going to train in judo, I need to be very humble. I don't know really anything about uh, carpentry. If I was going to train in carpentry, I would need to be so humble. When it comes to the Dharma, I may have been doing this for a little while, but there are, there are people who have been doing this three times, four times longer than me just in this lifetime. So I need to, I need to listen to these people with an open mind and not become an expert. When Zen, they talk about having beginner's mind. That means you, you always have the white belt on. You're always, you're always open to new information that might improve what you're doing. Just like the white belt has a completely open mind if they're in a good position to the black belts in the school. You don't want to become an expert. All the water runs down to the ocean. So the one who sees themselves as lowest of all will learn the most. If you want an ego trip, there's your ego trip. If you want to learn so much, see yourself as the lowest. Because there are others who know so, so, so much more than you do. 
or maybe you know a lot maybe you know a lot intellectually but there are so many people who have so much more experience Lama Zopa says, think that your realization, that the realizations in your mind are so small. They're not there. Even a realization of death and impermanence or the precious human rebirth, you don't even have those realizations. So he's saying, reflect upon your mental situation. Maybe you've been doing this a while and you have some constructed realizations. You know, maybe, maybe there's, when you really, really think about it, you go, yeah, you know, this life is really precious. I hope I don't waste it. Right? When you think about it, when you really think hard about it. But that doesn't come without thinking hard about it. There are others for whom it just occurs. As soon as they think about human life, bang, it's full-blown, full-blown psychophysical experience. Every cell in their body is just singing with so precious. Don't waste it. So precious. But not us. Not us. Because we haven't developed that level of, of spontaneous or unconstructed realization. It hasn't become who we are yet. It's not in our bones, right? It's not in our bones. It's just on the, on the skin level right now. And that's fine. You know, you have to start where you are. But this is an exercise in humility. What we're saying, I don't know. So much I don't know. And instead of getting depressed, instead of going, oh, I'm so, you know, I don't know anything. That's not the point. The point is that you're an open vessel. You, your mind has now become more open because you're not sitting around thinking you know everything. You've experienced everything. You're better than everyone. You don't need to rely on anyone for anything. It's not mentioned here, but also training in physical discipline really helps with humility. Why? Because you get direct access again and again and again to not knowing. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know you could do it like that. I didn't know there was another level to that. I didn't know you could interpret it like that. Same thing happens if you're a scholar. If you do any scholarly work, you find out you thought you knew everything and you learned that you knew well, really you don't know anything <laughs> there's so much to learn uh, everything has question marks now even though it's much more powerful so many question marks you don't want to be the mountain you want to be the ocean Okay, let's do our five minutes.
May the precious Bodhi mind not yet born arise and grow. May that arisen not decline, but increase more and more. May the precious supreme view of emptiness not yet born arise and grow. May that arisen not decline, but increase more and more. See you tonight.